In this video, we'll take a look at the Sprout Data Editor, its tools, and also some of the basic data types and classes that you'll be working with when you start building Sprout Data Assets. The Sprout Data Editor is core to the Sprout plugin, and there's a lot of stuff to cover. So let's get started. The Sprout Graph is the main tool that we use to build our Sprout. It's where we add branches, leaves, and other helpful data structures used to generate our asset. We can select a node in the graph to edit it in the Sprout stack. Here we see all of the modules that are used to generate the Sprout. These are split into execution stages, which are groups of modules that are run at different points in the simulation. Stages can be filtered using the buttons at the top of the stack. We'll isolate the branching stages. In the branch spawn stage, there are two modules. The first is our branch spawner. This is a required module, meaning it can't be deleted or moved, but it can be replaced with another module of the same type, in this case, a different branch spawner. This is done using the drop-down arrow in this row. If we select the multiple stem spawner, we now have options that change the spawning behavior. For now, we'll stick with the standard spawner. The second module we see in the stack is a branch initializer. This is used to set initial attribute values for our branch nodes. We'll edit the lifetime and width and see the changes update in real time. We can add more modules to the spawn stage by clicking the plus button in the execution stage row. We'll set the branch.position attribute to override the branch's spawn location. The buttons in this row let us move, activate, and delete this module. We can also move it in the stack by dragging it around. We'll delete this module and move on. The next execution stage we see in the stack is the branch update stage. This stage grows our branches. Clicking on our branch in the viewport lets us see how changing these inputs affects our stem's growth. We'll change the step length to change the space between the points in our branch. We also have a dynamic input setting the width of the branch. Dynamic inputs are functions that return a value based on provided inputs. Here we have a curve that gives us a decreasing value over the normalized age of the branch, 0 to 1 from start to end. We'll edit the curve in the stack to change the width of the branch. We can also pop out this window for easier editing. We can add our own dynamic inputs by clicking on the drop down arrow at the end of the row or by middle mouse clicking on the row we want to change. We'll add a multiply and drag the variable turtle.normalizedAge from our parameter palette so that the space between points increases as the simulation advances. We can add nested dynamic inputs as well in the same way. We'll add a sphere mask and set the input position to turtle position. We'll set the radius to 400 and the hardness to 0. We can now see the step length falling off for points farther away from the center. We can visualize this sphere mask by clicking this button in the input stack row. Now when we change the radius value, we see our visualization update. The visualizer can also be edited directly in the viewport by simply clicking it, moving it around, and scaling it. These visualizers are fully customizable in C++ and Blueprints, so when you write your own dynamic inputs, you can make your own visualizers. Now let's take a look at mesh generation. We'll use the filters at the top to isolate the mesh execution stages. In the generation stage, we have two required modules by default. A mesh node spawner, which determines where meshes should be spawned, and the mesh generator, which does the heavy lifting. These can be swapped out with other modules, but for now we'll focus on the standard ones. We'll switch to the wireframe view mode so that we can see our mesh updating in real time as we change the number of loops and the vertices per loop. We'll use a dynamic input to change the vertex color, which we can visualize using the show vertex colors button in the toolbar above. This is also where we can set the material of our branch. The standard mesh generator module has a few sub-modules as well. These are modules that are executed during mesh generation. For example, we can add UV channels to our mesh by adding to the UV generators group, and we can adjust UV tiling by editing these modules. 
We'll use a dynamic input to set the tiling value of our UVs based on the branch's length. Let's return to the sprout graph to add some child branches. We add nodes to the graph the same way you would in any blueprint. We'll right click to add a branch sprout node and connect it to our stem node. As you can see, we now have branches spawning from our stem. We can select this new node to see its modules in the sprout stack. The stem spawner and stem initializer have been replaced with new modules which behave differently but have a similar purpose. They spawn branches and they initialize attributes. A more convenient way to add child branches is to add an inherited node to the graph. We'll return to the graph panel and delete the new child node. We'll drag off our stem's output pin and select Inherited Branch Node from the dropdown, which will copy many of the parent node's inputs. While our stem spawner and initializer are still replaced, the inputs we created for step length, width, and material are all preserved. It's worth noting that these are not linked to the parent's inputs. They can be edited without affecting the parent branch. Keep in mind that you can return to the parent node at any time to change its values, and our child branches will update accordingly. Now let's take a look at forces. These are modules that are evaluated during the branch update stage to change a turtle's direction. We can add force modules by clicking the plus button and selecting an option below. We'll add a gravity force and see the branches begin to droop as they grow. By adding and editing forces, we can grow our branches in more interesting ways. We can also add forces that will affect all the branches in the sprout by going to the graph and adding a global forces node. These forces will combine with any existing forces. Now let's try adding some leaves. We'll go back to the sprout graph and add a leaf sprout node. In the sprout stack, we have a new execution stage called leaf spawn with a required leaf spawner module. Leaves are spawning, but we can't see them until we set up their mesh generation we can scroll down in the stack or isolate the mesh's execution stage and see that the leaf mesh generator requires a mesh source submodule. We could set this to read from an array of static meshes, but instead we'll add a sprout mesh builder source. Once we select an asset here, we can choose which meshes to copy using this dropdown. Now we should be able to see the results of our changes. We can add modules to the mesh generation stage to add some bend to our spawned leaves. Using modules in this stage, we can change the leaves normals, vertex positions, vertex colors, and a whole lot of other stuff. Lastly, we can spawn leaves from other leaves. We'll change the mesh on our parent leaf node to one that has sockets. We'll add a child leaf sprout node to the graph and replace its spawner with the spawn from sockets option. We'll update our mesh source and now we see leaves spawning from the parent sockets.